Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. I apologize for the uh, late start today. I appreciate you bearing with me. Uh, I do want to do uh, one thing at the top before I go to your questions. Um, I'm disappointed to report to uh, all of you that congressional Republicans are whistling past the political graveyard of a government shutdown. They do this as they continue to submit proposals to Democrats that are filled with ideological writers. We know there is a concerted Republican strategy that some Republicans talk about rather openly about seeking to use this must pass piece of budget legislation to compensate for their pretty sorry legislative record thus far this year. And the effort that they're engaged in now is to uh, lard the bill up with ideological writers. Let's be specific about what writers actually are. Writers are specific provisions that are inserted into larger pieces of legislation to provide a specific benefit to a specific special interest. This is essentially an earmark. And the earmarks that Republicans are contemplating right now are earmarks that would undermine Wall Street reform to benefit large financial institutions or undermine the President's implementation of the Clean Power Plan to benefit those companies and corporations that pollute our air and water. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, Republicans are uh, supporting uh, or proposing writers that would actually limit access that people have to health care. Uh, none of this is part of how the budget process is supposed to work. We've acknowledged on many previous occasions, and I'm sure we'll spend a lot of this month acknowledging, that the legislation that will be produced in this process will be a compromise. So I don't expect that every single provision that is included in this bill is going to be something that has the enthusiastic support of either Democrats on Capitol Hill uh, or the Democrat here in the White House. But what I can assure you is that if Republicans go back to the strategy of trying to pass budget legislation along party lines, they'll see that that process doesn't work. They can go ask former Speaker John Boehner how well that process works. It doesn't work very well for the party. Uh, it doesn't work very well for the country. And it risks the government shutdown that we know would not be good for the economy. So we are hopeful that in the nine days that remain for members of Congress to do their job, that Republicans will abandon this effort uh, to lard up the bill with ideological writers and actually work with Democrats in a genuinely bipartisan fashion to reach the kind of budget compromise that is clearly uh, within the best interest of the country and the best interest of our economy. So Josh, with that, let's go to your questions. Thanks, Josh. Uh, let's kick it off with a little bit of foreign policy. Okay. Does the U.S. have any uh, evidence or intelligence to back up the Russian military's claim uh, that Prime Minister Erdogan and his family are personally profiteering from the Islamic State oil trade? Mm -hmm. Josh, I've read a little bit about these claims. Uh, you know, for, to substantiate them, I'd encourage you to check with the Russian government and see what kind of evidence uh, they're citing. They've got some photos. <laughs> <Satellite> <laughs> information. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, you can certainly uh, take a look at uh, whether or not um, those satisfy uh, your questions. What I can tell you is that the President had the opportunity to meet with President Erdogan yesterday in Paris, where they discussed the issue of, of securing Turkey's long border with Syria. There are some parts of that bar border where the Turks have worked effectively to shut down the border, to secure the border in a way that has obvious national security benefits for the people of Turkey but also in a way that shuts down the flow of foreign fighters and shut down, shuts down uh, illicit finance that we know that ISIL is engaged in to try to fund their uh, ongoing operations. The concern that, the president, that President Obama raised directly with President Erdogan, and the President talked about this in his news conference a little bit yesterday, is that there continues to be a gap uh, along the Turkey-Syria border that is not secured to our satisfaction. And we do have concerns that ISIL is exploiting that gap to move foreign fighters and to uh, move black market products that can be used to finance their operations. Now, the irony of the Russians raising this concern is that there's plenty of evidence to indicate that 
the largest consumer of ISIL oil is actually Bashar al-Assad and his regime. A regime that only remains in place because it is being propped up by the Russians. So if the Russians are really concerned about uh, this uh, uh, ISIL's illicit finance efforts, they should take it up with Bashar al-Assad, the person that is relying on the Russians for their continued, for his continued ability to remain uh, in power. The other thing that I'll point out about this, Josh, and this goes to something that we discussed in the briefing in Paris on Monday, is that if Republicans in Congress were half as concerned about ISIL's illicit finance as Vladimir Putin, then they would stop blocking the nomination of Adam Zubin to the position in the Treasury Department that's responsible for shutting down ISIL's uh, illicit finance efforts. Adam Zubin is a financial expert who has served presidents in both parties. Even the, the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee acknowledges that he's eminently qualified for the position. But for some reason, Republicans on Capitol Hill won't even take a vote on him. It's astounding that we see all this criticism from members of Congress about the, uh, about the lack of progress against ISIL when there is this obvious thing that Republicans could do that would actually ensure that we can be more effective in fighting ISIL. So it's time for Republicans to get to work on that. Following uh, Secretary Carter's announcement about sending some more special ops forces uh, to Iraq, uh, Prime Minister Abadi essentially said, thanks, but no thanks. Was the US surprised by the public um, expression of uh, opposition from the Iraqi government? And do we plan to um, subject any deployment of special ops forces to Iraq to <coughs> specific approval from Baghdad? Josh, I'd encourage you to, to, to go back to the, um, to the Iraqi government on this. The, the comments that we saw from Prime Minister Abadi were actually specifically directed at the kind of ground combat force that the President has long said the United States would not uh, deploy to Iraq, principally because we do not envision a military solution to this ongoing problem. Uh, the United States uh, and the administration has been consulting with the Abadi government for quite some time now, uh, for uh, at least weeks, if not months, talking about the creation of this uh, expeditionary targeting force. So uh, I actually think if you go back to the, the uh, Abadi government to get greater f clarification, if you believe that that's what's needed, uh, that this is the kind of announcement that is made consistent with our ongoing effective coordination with the Abadi government and with Iraqi forces. So it was, like, it was a miscommunication. Essentially, the uh, Abadi government was responding to uh, an announcement that Carter had not made? No, no, no. I, I, well, I, I think there are a couple of things going on here. I know that Prime Minister Abadi did raise significant concerns with statements that were made by Senators McCain and Graham who did say that the Abadi government would somehow be interested in, in hosting 10,000 U.S. ground combat operations inside of Iraq. That's not something that the President supports. That also, it turns out, is not something that Prime Minister Abadi supports. Prime Minister Abadi uh, was consulted uh, and has been consulted over the last several weeks about, the, uh, about this uh, expeditionary targeting force that would be located uh, in Iraq. Uh, the number of troops that we're talking about is about 200. Uh, and Pr Prime Minister Abadi is supportive uh, of that effort. What he opposes uh, is what Senator McCain and Senator Graham have said uh, uh, about the large-scale, prolonged deployment of ground combat forces from the United States. Uh, the President doesn't believe that that would be in our best interest, and the President's long and consistently opposed that. Turning to the situation in Chicago, uh, how closely, uh, if at all, has the President been following uh, what's going on uh, there? And uh, you know, there have been calls now for uh, his former chief of staff, the mayor, uh, to step down. Um, does the President have any feelings about whether that would be appropriate at this point? Josh, the President is obviously uh, aware of the quite intense national coverage of the events uh, in his hometown uh, over the last week or so. Uh, and the President has been following it. Uh, I don't know that he's had the opportunity to speak to Mayor Emanuel in the last week. Obviously, the President's been uh, spent a fair amount of time overseas the last few weeks. Uh, but, um, you know, I can tell you that what we did see from Mayor Emanuel uh, in the news conference that he held yesterday was a, um, a personal commitment to following through on reforms that he believes are needed uh, within the Chicago Police Department. 
Uh, the mayor also acknowledged that those reforms are not the kinds of reforms that can be uh, implemented overnight, uh, can't be implemented with the flip of a switch, but rather will require the sustained commitment to implementing those reforms by the leadership of that city uh, over the long term. Uh, and Mayor Emanuel um, offered up his own personal commitment to follow through on implementing those reforms. Obviously, the citizens of the city of Chicago will have to determine um, who, you know, who should be running the city, including uh, evaluating his commitment over the long term to uh, implementing those kinds of reforms. Uh, and um, that's why we have elections, is so that city officials are held accountable, as they should be. And just one last one. Does the president intend to sign the uh, No Child Left Behind rewrite that's poised to pass the House today? Uh, this is uh, a piece of legislation that the administration uh, has uh, worked with Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill to, um, to write and pass. Uh, it is something that the administration uh, strongly supports. Uh, it, um, in a variety of ways, in, uh, finally uh, implements the kinds of changes to the No Child Left Behind legislation that the President's long been calling for. The President has been advocating for uh, changes to that bill for uh, nearly six years now. Uh, and the, th the things that are included in the Every Student Succeeds Act are things, uh, are reforms that will eliminate the one-size-fits-all federal mandates that characterized the previous legislation. Uh, it also will, uh, and in some ways this is the priority for the administration, it will reduce the reliance on over-testing that has plagued far too many classrooms uh, all across the country. So uh, we'll have more to say on this uh, in the weeks ahead, but um, and Josh, I can tell you that, that this, uh, this bill reflects uh, a lot of uh, good bipartisan work that's gotten done on Capitol Hill. Uh, it has included uh, important contributions from the administration, uh, and uh, you know, we're enthusiastic about uh, this bill. Like every bipartisan piece of legislation, it is a compromise, and there are some aspects of the bill that uh, are not priorities of the administration. But uh, all in all, when you take a look at the priorities that we have laid out, uh, this, uh, this legislation certainly uh, addresses the, uh, uh, the priorities that we've set. Okay. Jeff. Josh, what's the White House's uh, reaction or feelings about the House's latest uh, work on the visa waiver program? Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, there has been some work uh, underway between Democrats and Republicans on the Hill, both in the House and the Senate, uh, in close coordination with the administration. Obviously, these programs are quite technical in nature. Uh, and is important for our national security professionals, particularly the Department of Homeland Security, to be directly involved in, uh, in those conversations. Um, there, I know that there have been some legislative proposals that have been put forward both in the House and the Senate. Uh, each of those proposals is something that is still being reviewed by the administration, so I don't have a specific position on the legislation to, put, to, to share with you. Uh, but given the changes that the administration has been able to make to this program um, you know, using the authority that we have, um, it should be clear, I think, you know, to you and to members of Congress that we believe this is an area uh, worthy of some bipartisan cooperation, uh, that putting in place the properly calibrated reforms would effectively strengthen the national security of the country. The reason that the reforms need to be effectively calibrated is that there are some elements of this program they were originally put in place that facilitate the free flow of commerce and travel um, from other countries to the United States in a way that's really important for our economy. So we want to make sure that these reforms are not so onerous that they inhibit um, our participation in the international economy. But of course, our national security interests come first. Uh, and so we're focused on our national security interests. We're going to work with, with Congress in bipartisan fashion on some reforms, but we do want to be careful that we don't undermine the economic benefits, uh, or at least entirely undermine the economic benefits that are uh, part and partial of the visa waiver program. Okay. Um, speaking of national security, <laughs> can you give us an update on the status of the plan to close Guantanamo mm -hmm. and whether or not the costs that the Pentagon uh, assigned or proposed for bringing a prison, prisoners to the United States uh, was too onerous or too high for the White House? Jeff, I know there's been some reporting uh, on this. I, I don't have all, uh, new information to share with you about the details of the conversations between the President and his national security team about this 
national security priority. Uh, I can tell you that part of the criteria that we've laid out, well, let me say it this way. The President's motivation for closing the President of Guantanamo Bay uh, essentially is twofold. The first is that we know that terrorists around the world use the continued operation of the President of Guantanamo Bay uh, as a recruiting tool. And it has proven to be uh, a particularly persuasive one, uh, unfortunately. And it is our view, it's the President's view, that that recruiting tool should be taken away. Uh, and closing the President of Guantanamo Bay would uh, serve that goal. The second reason that the President is enthusiastic about closing the President of Guantanamo Bay is that it's not an effective or efficient use of taxpayer dollars. That the cost of operating the prison there, uh, I believe, is uh, uh, you know on the order of four hundred million dollars a year, uh, and uh, it certainly is um, far more expensive to continue to operate the prison the way that it is now than it would be to pursue the approach that the administration has laid out for closing the prison. That by transferring those individuals who are eligible to transfer, uh, by prosecuting those individuals that we believe can be effectively prosecuted, uh, and then detaining in the United States uh, those individuals that cannot be safely transferred or effectively prosecuted, uh, would be far cheaper uh, and would be a much better use of taxpayer dollars, considering that it would also take away a recruiting tool that is used by terrorists. So it's, we've got a pretty common sense case to make. I know that there have been some national security concerns that have been raised by Democrats and Republicans, frankly, on Capitol Hill. But those concerns don't account for the fact that there are already dozens of convicted terrorists uh, in U.S. prisons on U.S. soil right now. And that doesn't pose an undue threat to our national security. Uh, so, you know, we haven't heard a, a particularly persuasive justification for why the strategy that we're trying to pursue uh, isn't a good idea. And the, the other thing that warrants mentioning, and I'll keep this short, is that there are a whole host of Republicans that actually agree with the President's position, uh, including uh, George W. Bush, the President's predecessor, including uh, Senator John McCain, Senator Lindsey Graham, Senator uh, Susan Collins, uh, including uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, uh, and even national security officials like uh, Brent Scowcroft and uh, Condoleezza Rice. So among those who have devoted uh, most of their lives to keeping the country safe, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you agree that closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay should be a priority. And the only reason that it hasn't gotten done so far is that, Repo that, that members of Congress uh, have blocked it. So my question in response to the reporting by the journal is mm -hmm. whether or not the Pentagon's proposal is too expensive, and if that's something, for that reason, why don't you present it back? Yeah. And what I'm saying is that I'm just not going to get into the, to the private consultations between the President and his national security team. What I will tell you is something that we've said before. Uh, which is relevant to your question, which is that uh, the President does believe that one of the reasons to close the prison at Guantanamo Bay is that we can more effectively um, uh, deal with the threats posed by these individuals uh, by closing the prison uh, and transferring those that can be transferred, prosecuting those that can be prosecuted, uh, and housing in the United States uh, those that uh, can't be dispensed with in the two previous categories. But does that hurt your argument about costs, if the cost of a prison on U.S. soil is ridiculously high? Well, again, uh, what uh, you'll, everyone will have an opportunity to evaluate that once a uh, specific plan has been put forward. Uh, you know, we've said that we'll present that plan to Congress, and when we do, we'll also make it public, and the people have an opportunity to crunch the numbers for themselves. Do you have any sense of when that plan is going to be ready? Uh, I don't have an update for you on timing. Okay. All right. Thanks. Let's move around a little bit. Cheryl. Thanks, Josh. Um, yesterday, uh, House and Senate conferees unveiled a five-year uh, highway funding bill. Uh, has the White House seen it, and what do you think of it? Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have seen it, uh, and we certainly applaud Congress's bipartisan efforts to develop a long-term surface transportation bill. Uh, if passed, this legislation would be a real step forward for our transportation infrastructure after years of short-term patches. We've talked a lot about the need that state and local authorities have for some certainty. Well, infrastructure projects often, at least the most impactful ones, often uh, will take years to build. Uh, and if the federal government uh, is providing funding at increments of a few months at a time, 
it's going to undermine their ability to effectively plan for the long term. So uh, putting forward something like a five-year proposal is obviously an important step in the right direction. The thing that you'll note, Cheryl, is that the administration has put forward a transportation funding bill uh, that actually is substantially larger. Uh, and so we would actually view this legislation as a step in the right direction, but only a first step, because we believe that there are more infrastructure projects that are worthy of funding that would create jobs in the short term and lay a long-term foundation for our ongoing economic strength over the long term. And um, so, you know, we'll see what, uh, what Congress chooses to do from here. Sign it, right? <laughs> well, that's, uh, I, I'm certainly applauding uh, Congress's bipartisan efforts to pass the bill because if it's passed, uh, the President would sign it. Okay, great. I just, real quick to follow up on your opening comments about appropriations. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you were asked this a couple days ago, but do, do you still stand that the President will not sign any more short term CRs? Well, the way that we described this before is the President would not sign a CR, uh, another CR, like the one that he signed earlier this fall. Uh, and that is to say the President signed that previous continuing resolution to give Congress additional time to negotiate a bipartisan budget agreement. Congress has had ample time to negotiate that agreement. And I do not envision a scenario where the President uh, signs another CR to give Congress more time to negotiate. Um, you know, what I allowed for in a, uh, in a briefing that we did earlier this week in Paris uh, is the possibility that the President may need to sign a one or two day CR that would uh, merely give Congress the congressional machinery time to pass uh, a completed um, negotiation uh, or a bill that's been uh, effectively negotiated. Uh, so I would leave space for that, but I would not envision a scenario where the President signs um, another continuing resolution um, the way that he did earlier this fall. Okay. April. Josh, I have a couple of questions on a couple of different subjects. Um, starting off with um, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, does this administration believe that the Justice Department should be investigating the, the McDonald case? Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, April, this is a decision for uh, federal career prosecutors at the Department of Justice to make. Uh, and so any uh, comment on uh, the White House's preference or the President's preference uh, could be viewed as some as uh, interfering with what should be an independent criminal investigation. So, It's not necessarily a preference I'm in, a, in, in the way I guess I'm looking at it. What I'm asking is with the facts that are on the ground, the facts, not what we feel in the present, as you said, he's been watching this inten intensely. With the facts that we know, does this rise to the occasion of a Justice Department probe into this matter? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the Justice Department that will make that determination. They're, they're looking at the same facts that, uh, that all of us are, and uh, that'll be their responsibility to determine. Now, I want to ask you about Rahm Emanuel himself. Um, he's had the privilege to work in two administrations, the Clinton administration and this administration. Mm -hmm. During his time in the Clinton administration, his portfolio included criminal justice. During his time here, was there ever any time that he gave input on issues of criminal justice, particularly uh, when this administration was focusing in on different issues when Eric Holder was here mm -hmm. on issues of criminal justice. Uh, April, it's hard for me to account for all of the uh, conversations that, uh, that the former Chief of Staff would have had uh, with uh, members of the administration or with the President or even members of the Cabinet. Um, I can tell you that, uh, that when, uh, when Mayor Emanuel was serving as White House Chief of Staff, we were in the midst of digging out of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And I know that, the, uh, that most of his time was spent um, focused on the economic policy development process that has yielded important results for the American people and for the American economy. I think that is a pretty good endorsement of, the, uh, of his service and his tenure here at the White House. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, but like I said, I can't account for all the conversations that he may have had, but uh, criminal justice was certainly not the focus of his efforts while he was the uh, chief of staff to President Obama. Well, as we know, Rahm Emanuel is a very vocal person, and um, he makes his feelings known easily. Um, and he's not shy. He's not shy. I'm glad we agree on that. So with that, there was a poignant moment in this administration, uh, the Beer Summit, when President Obama, at the beginning of his administration, uh, talked about Skip Gates and the issue of profiling and policing. Did Rahm Emanuel step in with his, 
with the history that he's had with his portfolio from the Clinton administration and his efforts of zero tolerance and he didn't want to get into profiling. Did he talk about that with the president when there was this controversy within the White House of how to handle the aftermath of the president's statements on the Skip Gates situation? Uh, I, I don't know, uh, and I'm certainly not going to get into any private conversations between the president and his chief of staff. But at this point, it is, it is an issue. It is, it is part of the... The, the, the scope, the landscape of who Rahm Emanuel is and what he thinks about policing as it relates to what's happening in Chicago. But I think the way that people will uh, judge his handling of these issues, I think rightly so, is the way that he continues to handle this very difficult situation uh, in Chicago. He's the mayor of the city and he's got the responsibility for, um, for instituting the kinds of reforms that he himself has acknowledged are uh, badly needed here. And I think people will rightly uh, judge him and his handling of these issues based on his response to this incident and on his ability to keep his commitment to be focused on implementing these reforms over the long term. Uh, that's a decision for Mayor Emanuel and the, and the uh, voters of Chicago to make. Uh, he has obviously uh, confronted this uh, situation uh, over the course of the last week um, quite directly and already taken some steps to uh, indicate his own commitment to addressing some of the problems that he has seen. Uh, but again, it's up to the people of Chicago and the mayor himself to evaluate uh, his performance in responding to the situation. And one last subject, Harvard. Uh, there's a lot of um, news about uh, what's going on at Harvard with the Crest, and then also with the issue of some African American faculty members having their faces blacked out. And we understand the president is still very close to many people at Harvard. And with that, and, and he spoke out um, very strongly about diversity issues in 1991 at Harvard. At Harvard. So what's his thought process right now about his alma mater and what's happening there when it comes to racial issues there? I haven't spoken to him about this situation on the on the campus at Harvard. Can you ask him, please? Because it's, 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 uh, it's a big issue. Well, Harvard maybe. University, the school that the president was the head of the law review, the school that the president attended. This is a big deal. Can, can you get some information? Mm -hmm. for uh, well, I'll see what I can do. Thank you. All right. Byron. Uh, Republicans are considering including a provision on refuge Syrian refugees in the spending bill. The White House has said it would threaten to veto a similar proposal as a standalone bill. Would the White House veto a spending bill that included a Syrian refugees provision? Well, uh, Byron, obviously the uh, – uh, let me say a couple things about that. The, the concern that we – well, I think the President uh, spoke in uh, rather colorful terms. Uh, and I think with some passion about the concerns that he had with the uh, efforts of some in the Republican Party to suggest that uh, refugees, for example, should be subjected to a religious test of one kind or another. Um, and I think the President talked about how that is not just contrary to our values as Americans, uh, but also raised concerns about the impact that that would have on our ability to protect the country and to fight ISIL. Uh, so. Uh, We've also talked about the specific proposal, the one specific proposal that the House has voted uh, on this issue uh, would not actually substantially contribute to our national security. Refugees continue to be the most thoroughly vetted individuals that enter uh, the United States. They're subjected to uh, background checks, uh, biographical and biometric information is collected. It is vetted through databases that are maintained by the National Counterterrorism Center, the Department of Defense international law enforcement agencies, the FBI, um, and we continue to see the, the President certainly continues to see the United States of America as a place where we respond to the needs of those who are most vulnerable. Uh, and, um, but that, that certainly doesn't come uh, after our need to protect our national security. And that's why individuals who apply through this program are subjected to more screening and more vetting than anybody else who tries to enter the country. So we'll take a look at the uh, specific proposals. Uh, we believe that much more fruitful work can be done in the area of re reforming some aspects of the visa waiver program. Uh, and there have been some Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill that have signaled a willingness to work with the administration on that. Uh, we believe that actually would make the country safer. That's why we've already taken some steps to implement some changes to that program. Uh, there are some additional steps that Congress could take and we would be supportive of, uh, of them doing that. Uh, we've cautioned them to be careful about not undermining entirely the economic benefits associated with this program. So the, you know, this continues to be an open uh, dialogue with members of Congress. And um, you know, hopefully 
uh, Republicans uh, will be interested in um, actually strengthening our national security and not just trying to score cheap political points uh, by targeting some of the most vulnerable human beings on the planet. One more. Um, the Washington Post is reporting that the Chinese government has arrested hackers suspected of breaching the uh, OPM database. Uh, is the administration aware of those reports, and do you have any reaction? Uh, I've seen those reports. I don't have a specific reaction to share with you. Uh, I would point out uh, a couple of things, though, Byron. The first is the president did have the opportunity to meet with President Xi in Paris uh, two days ago. Uh, the issue of cybersecurity was raised in their uh, conversations. Uh, this uh, continues to be uh, a top priority uh, of the president, uh, President Obama, uh, in terms of our relationship uh, with China. and. Uh, we believe there's an opportunity for us to build on the commitment uh, that, the China, that President Xi made when he visited the White House earlier this fall, that the Chinese government will uh, not conduct or knowingly support cyber-enabled economic espionage for commercial gain. This is a commitment that the U.S. government has made for some time and one that we abide by. And we certainly welcomed the Chinese commitment to this principle as well. The question is, you know, can we continue to build on that commitment uh, in a way that enhances uh, the national security and the economy of the United States. The one thing that certainly can be pointed to uh, as uh, at least incremental progress uh, is that Chinese officials did follow through on our joint commitment to pursue a uh, cybersecurity dialogue. Uh, and actually right now, the, uh, one of the senior Chinese officials that's responsible for uh, cybersecurity uh, is in the United States uh, and over the course of the day yesterday and today has been engaged in conversations with the Secretary of Homeland Security and with the Attorney General uh, about some of these issues. Uh, we do believe that that enhanced uh, dialogue uh, can be used to advance uh, our interests uh, with regard to this specific priority. Okay. Ron. Uh, back to Chicago. Uh, what was the President's reaction when he saw the video of the young man being shot and killed? Well, Ron, the President has seen the video. Uh, the president had the kind of human reaction that I think lots of other people across the country uh, have had to that specific video. The president, of course, is limited in talking about uh, that reaction, and, uh, and I'm limited in uh, the degree to which I can talk about his reaction to it because of his uh, unique role as president of the United States. You know, by commenting on uh, this at great length, I think would be uh, viewed by some as uh, improperly interfering with an uh, ongoing independent criminal investigation. So. I can confirm for you that he has seen the video, uh, but I don't have a lot of details to share about his reaction. And just to uh, be clear, is, is there a DOJ investigation going on now of the police department or not? Well, uh, I believe, uh, you can check this with the Department of Justice, uh, that they, well, let me say it this way. It's at least been publicly reported that the Department of Justice is conducting an investigation uh, into uh, the death of uh, this individual. Uh, and. Uh, you can confirm that with, uh, with the Department of Justice. There has been a separate request that has been made by the Attorney General of Illinois, the State Attorney General of Illinois, for a broader investigation of the entire police department by the Department of Justice, something that's called a patterns and practice uh, investigation. And uh, the decision to pursue an investigation like that would be one that's made by the Department of Justice. I don't believe that they've announced that that's something that they are, are already doing, uh, but you can check with them to see if the request from the uh, state attorney general is one that they're willing to entertain. I, I know the administration is, I think, uh, opened or has about 20 of these pattern and practices uh, investigations going on. It's a, I believe it's an unprecedented number. Does the president feel that this is a situation in his hometown towards the end of his tenure here on an issue that he has spoken out about a lot, policing in America, that he's made a priority? Why not speak out about this? Why not make a point of what's happened here if he is so moved by what he saw and what he's witnessing within the limits of, of the ongoing investigation. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people are just are saying, you know, come on, step up. Yeah. I, and I think that's an entirely legitimate question. And, and what you point out, Ron, is that there are limits on the president uh, about what he can say publicly based on uh, his desire to avoid the perception that he's somehow interfering with an independent ongoing investigation. Some of that's because the president is determined, is committed to the idea of these kinds of independent investigations. And the fact is, uh, you know, even if he had significant concerns to express, it could be viewed then by some that the only reason the Department of Justice is looking into it 
uh, is that the President himself expressed concerns. And the President believes that these kinds of situations should be evaluated and investigated based on the facts uh, and based on the merits of the arguments that are presented by uh, either side. And so it, uh, it is a, a difficult constraint. Uh, and it is the kind of thing that um, I think the President uh, intends to speak about more freely uh, once he is uh, the former President of the United States. Uh, but until then, his uh, ability to communicate about this at great length is limited. Given, given his um, concern about this issue, I would think, and that this has been going on for a year, I would think that he sees this as a step back, a setback in his efforts to improve policing generally around the country. Well, uh, Ron, I, I think the President, as you point out, has talked about this in general, this issue in general, uh, quite a bit over the last year and a half or so. Uh, the President did convene a task force on 21st century policing that has uh, yielded uh, a set of recommendations and best practices that have been lauded by law enforcement officials across the country. There are a lot of good ideas that were put forward by local law enforcement and by civil rights activists and by academics and lawyers who all came together to put forward these recommendations. There are a number of cities that have chosen to try to implement these best practices. And uh, you have to talk to the city of Chicago about whether or not uh, or to what degree they have implemented uh, these kinds of best practices. The thing that is true, though, is that these law enforcement organizations are, as they should be, uh, controlled at the local level. Uh, and the federal government can't impose uh, these best practices on local law enforcement organizations across the country. What we can do is uh, put forward these recommendations that are based on uh, informed consultation with law enforcement leaders and civil rights activists and community activists and lawyers from all across the country. Uh, but it's going to be up to individual jurisdictions to decide how these best practices can be applied uh, in their communities. Just one question. Mm -hmm. This 120 special forces uh, troops who are going in, is this part of train, advise, and equip? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a good question. I, 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 let me say a couple things about that. I mean, the first is, I think the, the, the easiest way to describe it to you is when we have talked about the kinds of uh, changes that we're making to our counter-ISIL strategy, we describe those changes as the intensification of those aspects of our strategy that have shown some progress or yielded some progress, uh, and taking away investments from those aspects of the strategy that didn't work very well. One thing that has proven to be uh, effective in a limited number of cases, admittedly, uh, is the use of uh, special operators. So, for example, there's been uh, at least one operation that's been conducted to free hostages that were taken uh, by ISIL. Uh, there's another situation where special operators conducted a raid against an ISIL leader, uh, and the result of that operation was the death of that ISIL leader the, um, and the collection of a significant amount of uh, of intelligence. Uh, I know that some of our intelligence officials have described it as a treasure chest uh, of intelligence information that to this day, this is an operation that was carried out months ago, back in May, I believe, to this day it continues to be a valuable source of information for operations and targets that are being uh, uh, hit by uh, coalition military uh, and are advancing other elements of our strategy, like shutting down the flow of foreign fighters and shutting down uh, their, their illicit financing. So this is an in intensification of one element of our strategy that has uh, yielded some fruit. It is being done in close coordination uh, and consultation with uh, the Iraqi government. Uh, and you know, we're optimistic that it can advance our train, advise, and assist uh, mission. It, it just sounds like it's a, a more um, independent mission by U.S. forces than training, advising, and equipping working with the Iraqis and the, and the Peshmerga on, on the ground. So why can't the administration just say this is a change in strategy and, and something different? And what's the, the, I, the, the criticism has always been, as it's now, yeah. is that you're just reacting yeah. to events. And, and this is not a proactive and aggressive way to, to solve this problem now. Well, I assure you that the people who are on the receiving end of more than 8,000 strikes from our counter-ISIL coalition believe this is a pretty aggressive, proactive strategy. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, ISIL leaders who uh, are concerned for their own safety uh, and have taken significant steps to try to protect themselves uh, from these strikes or these kinds of raids 
uh, view our strategy as quite aggressive uh, and quite proactive. I think the reason, Ron, that we're not describing it as a change in our strategy is that it's consistent with what we've been doing for quite some time. There are situations where the United States uh, or United States special operators have conducted raids in other places as well to take out those high value targets that could pose a threat to the United States. Uh, there have been operations that we publicly discussed in places like Yemen uh, and in Libya, uh, where uh, this has proved to be an effective strategy of taking off the battlefield those who could pose a threat to the United States or our interests. Uh, and so uh, it, uh, I, I don't think it should be particularly surprising to people that this is a strategy that we are seeking to intensify uh, in our counter ISIL uh, effort. Okay? All right. Peter, nice to see you. Thank you. Is the President still friendly with Rahm Emanuel? The, uh, uh, Mayor Emanuel does have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, come, to the, come to Washington uh, periodically in his uh, role as the mayor, and uh, it, it would, would not be unusual for him to come by the White House when he does. I know when the President was in uh, Chicago uh, a month or so ago, uh, the President had the opportunity to visit with the mayor then, too. So uh, sure, they, they worked closely together for a, a couple of years while uh, Mr. Emanuel served as the President's Chief of Staff. So is the President just keeping quiet about what's happening in Chicago because the mayor there is his friend? Because you mentioned that he doesn't want to interfere with an ongoing investigation, but he spoke out very early on with the Ferguson case, uh, and that officer wasn't even charged with anything. And all that I can think of that's a difference is that he wasn't friends with the mayor of Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter, what we've seen is we've seen these kinds of situations end up in a lot of cities across the country, places like Baltimore and Minneapolis. Uh, and the President, in each of those situations, has been cognizant of the limits that are placed on the President of the United States, that his public expressions, either of support or criticism, could be perceived by some as interfering with an independent law enforcement uh, investigation. And the President believes strongly that law enforcement investigations should be conducted based solely on the facts and free from even the appearance of uh, political influence. So. Uh, that explains entirely uh, the decision that the President has made uh, with regard to this specific case. And you mentioned that the President has seen the video. Does he mm -hmm. think that there's anything to the theory that Rahm Emanuel waited to release it so that he could get reelected? I, I haven't heard the, the, the President opine uh, uh, on potential motivations there. And then to that end, is the President worried that if Rahm Emanuel is not the mayor, some of his post-presidential projects, like his library in Chicago, are going to be more difficult to get going. Not at all. Not at all. To that end, one separate question. In Paris, the President said that he's anticipating a Democrat succeeding him so that uh, the things that he's been working on will continue, that a, a Democratic President would continue with the themes that the President has been following. Does that signal, should that signal to us that the President is more concerned with his legacy than with laws that are going to last a long time, no matter who the President is? No, I think it should be a clear signal to you that the President is quite committed to the kinds of priorities that he has sought to advance uh, in office. And everything from reforming Wall Street to make sure that taxpayers are no longer on the hook for bailing out big banks that make risky bets that go bad, uh, to making sure that we continue to implement the Affordable Care Act in a way that will expand health care coverage to uh, 17 million Americans. Those are values and priorities that this President has, has fought for uh, in office, and he's hopeful that the next President of the United States will be somebody who shares those va values uh, and will continue to fight for them. Unfortunately, we've not seen a commitment from Republicans uh, to holding Wall Street accountable or expanding uh, access to health care or cutting health care costs for middle class families. But those are values that have been championed by the Democratic candidates for President, and it's why the President uh, uh, hopes that one of them is going to succeed him. Okay. Mara. Just to ask the wrong question in another way, the criticism is that he, that he spoke out more and seemed to feel less constrained in Baltimore and, and Ferguson than he does now, even though the situations were pretty similar. So do you, that's the criticism. Do you reject that? Yeah. That he somehow I, I, said, was it, spoke more freely or felt less constrained, even though there were investigations into those incidents, yeah. too? Uh, no, I, I, do, I do reject that. I, I don't think that's a fair comparison, and I think I've I try to describe at length uh, exactly, um, you know, why the, why the president is not, uh, um, you know, why the president is limited in what he can say publicly about this specific case. Okay, Mary. 
One more uh, on Chicago. Has the president spoken with the McDonald family? Does he have any plans to meet with them? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, of any calls at the president's place to the family, but. Uh, um, so no, I don't know if that's occurred yet. I'm not aware of any specific plan to call them, but I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Okay. And on Iraq, uh, the Washington Post is reporting that it's widely viewed there that the U.S. is actually helping ISIS. Uh, how concerned is the administration about that level of suspicion of the U.S. there, and, and what can you do to change this perception? Well, obviously those sorts of uh, suggestions are completely absurd and fly in the face of, of at least one fact which is that the United States has built and is leading a coalition of 65 nations to degrade and ultimately destroy that organization. Uh, so um, this is the result of a, um, a coordinated and intense uh, Iranian-backed propaganda campaign, uh, but it certainly bears no reference to the reality of the situation. Uh, but how can the U.S. gain influence if people on the ground think that the U.S. is, is supporting the terrorists? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think our goal here, Mary, is to not impose a U.S. solution uh, or even a military solution, but rather to build up the capacity of Iraqi forces, to build up the capacity and strength of the Iraqi central government, to unite that country, to face the threat that they that, that is posed by ISIL. That is ultimately our goal. And uh, I'm not going to suggest to you that somehow this propaganda campaign doesn't matter, uh, but it's certainly, countering it is certainly not the focal point of our efforts. Our goal is to uh, help the Iraqis do for themselves what they can only do for themselves, which is to unite their country across sectarian lines uh, and face down uh, this ISIL threat is in the interest of the United States for the Iraqi people and the Iraqi government and Iraqi forces to succeed in that effort. That's why we're helping them. But ultimately, it's going to be their responsibility to achieve this goal. Okay. JC. We'll continue with ISIL. In an all-out effort to basically reverse a vote taken two years ago, today Prime Minister David Cameron has told the members of Parliament that bombing ISIL in Syria will keep the British people safe. It's a many-hour debate in the House of Commons today. It'll end with a vote on whether the UK joins France, the US, Russia, in bombing Syria. If authorized, uh, this bombing mission would begin within days if they, in fact, deliver the vote that Mr. Cameron would like, and that seems very likely. Uh, is this good news, and what are, the, what are the comments of this administration on this possibility? Well, JC, obviously the United States and the United Kingdom have for a long time had a special relationship. And that special relationship extends to the operations that we've undertaken together over the years to provide for the national security of the citizens of both of our countries. Uh, and uh, the UK has already made a substantial contribution to our counter ISIL effort. Uh, there are a variety of ways where the influence and capabilities of the, uh, of the British military and the British government are used to great effect to advance our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. But we obviously would welcome greater contributions from any of our allies, including uh, our uh, British allies. And we would welcome um, uh, a vote and a commitment from um, uh, the British people and the British government to a even, an even greater British military commitment to our counter ISIL campaign. OK. Uh, Joe, nice to see you. Josh. <clears throat> On the Specialized Expeditionary Targeting Force, um, they are supposed to be tasked with killing or capturing ISIS leaders. Um, in the event some are captured, where are they going to be held? Are they going to be held in theater? Um, I assume that you would rule out Gitmo. Absolutely. Um, so where are they going to be kept? Well, let me do one other thing. There's one other part of their mission that um, you didn't mention in your short question. You're just trying to keep your question short, I'm sure. But um, it's important that it not be overlooked. There's an important intelligence component to their missions and their ability to go and scoop up paperwork and hard drives and other information that can be critical to our ongoing efforts uh, is a central part uh, of this strategy. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it was a central part of the uh, one of the main benefits of the Abu Sayyaf raid that was carried out earlier this year. Um, as it relates to individuals that are detained in the course of these uh, operations, uh, you know, the Department of Defense will have to make a, a determination. Uh, we'll obviously be working closely with uh, the Iraqi government for these raids that are conducted uh, in Iraq. The situation in Syria is obviously more complicated. Um, 
there, there is at least one precedent for this, which is that in the course of the Abu Sayyaf raid against that uh, ISIL leader, uh, his wife was detained in the context of that raid. Uh, and his wife was turned over to uh, Kurdish authorities uh, because there uh, was some evidence to indicate that she had at least been complicit, if not actively involved, in some of the hostage taking uh, that ISIL has engaged in. Uh, and uh, that's why she was uh, turned over to Kurdish uh, uh, authorities. Uh, I, I frankly haven't been briefed on the latest on her case, so I, I don't have an update for you on that. But uh, that's an example of one way that, um, that this process could work. But I would uh, certainly rule out for you uh, the uh, sending any additional uh, prisoners to the prison of Guantanamo Bay. Not even temporarily. Not even temporarily. Um, Senator McCain, and you got a question along these lines a minute ago, uh, called the expeditionary force uh, reactive and incremental and specifically in response to the Paris attacks. So uh, what does the White House say to the notion that perhaps this was a good time to, to roll out this new idea just in order to switch gears after a bad week on the ISIS front? Joe, I can tell you that this is actually something that has been contemplated for um, a number of weeks now. And back uh, earlier this fall when we rolled out uh, a package of, uh, of new intensifications of our counter-ISIL strategy, uh, that this is something that was, complement that, that was contemplated uh, in the context of that rollout. And if you go and look carefully at some of the language that, was, that we used at the time, we described uh, our desire to enhance or increase our capability to carry out raids. Uh, this is exactly what we had in mind. This is something that we've been talking to the Iraqi government about since before even that announcement was made back in October. So uh, the notion that this is somehow our response to Paris is, um, is wrong. Uh, and I think it, what it does, it reflects, again, what our strategy has been all along, which is to seek to intensify those aspects of our strategy that are yielding some progress, and this is this happens to be one of those areas. And you haven't gotten the mission creep question today. Um, the, the, the defense. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, you're right. It's a legitimate one. I welcome the opportunity to answer it. Especially because the defense secretary said that uh, he would not uh, rule out make, making recommendations that would increase the force size, mm -hmm. um, especially with this new announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, is what are you going to do about the notion of this opening the door to further involvement? Well, again, I, I, again, first of all, I would start by saying that this is um, consistent with what we've been doing uh, in Iraq and in Syria in the past. Uh, it is also a, an intensification that only involves, but that involves about 200 United States military personnel. That certainly stands in contrast to the more than 100,000 U.S. troops that were on the ground in Iraq um, and sent there by the previous administration. So, um, you know, we're quite cognizant of uh, our ongoing commitment to making sure that the kind of offensive, enduring ground combat operation that uh, was in place under the orders of uh, President George W. Bush uh, are not in place this time uh, because we do not believe that that served the interests of the United States particularly well. Uh, and I, I will say, Joe, though, that if there are members of Congress uh, who are concerned about this, there's something they can do about it. For more than a year, the President of the United States has been calling on the United States Congress to pass an authorization to use military force, where they could be more specific about what they view as an appropriate response to the ISIL campaign. Uh, for more than nine months, Congress has had the opportunity to consider a specific written legislative proposal that is put forward by this administration. The President directed his Secretary of Defense and his Secretary of State to go testify on the record under oath before Congress on this exact issue. And what's Congress done? Nothing. They haven't done anything. And uh, the concern that we have expressed is too often in Congress it's easy to suggest that, well, something's so hard uh, that that ultimately is a good excuse for not doing anything. And we've seen Congress been doing, you know, doing that for a year. And that's unfortunate. And it certainly is not the kind of leadership that the American people expect from their rep elected representatives to Congress. And last question. Uh, on CNN, the former uh, director of the DIA said the White House ignored the rise of ISIS because it didn't fit into the president's 
re-election plans? What, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Well, he's wrong, uh, and the reason I'll tell you that is uh, I don't think it will become, I don't think it will come as a surprise to you that the intelligence chief at the Pentagon is not included in discussions about the president's re-election strategy. So he doesn't know what he's talking about. Let's move around. Molly. Uh, with the detention question, um, I was at the Pentagon and they said that this is a policy question that hasn't been determined yet. The what then? Um, you pointed to Sayef, but she was an Iraqi citizen and mm -hmm. it's likely the case if they're going to be doing unilateral raids into Syria to get and taking them back to Iraq that they won't be Iraqi citizens. So I know that um, that you said that uh, that hasn't quite been determined yet, but that the Pentagon should determine it. They said it hasn't been answered. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been resolved. What will happen with them? Well, again, th you know, this, is, this will be something that will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis moving forward. Uh, and the situation that you cited, you know, this, the, the wife of Abu Sayyaf, uh, she was an Iraqi citizen. She was also somebody that was accused of being complicit in, uh, at least complicit in, the hostage taking of some um, Yazidi ethnic minorities. Uh, and so that's why she was uh, turned over to Kurdish officials uh, for, um, to allow the criminal justice process to move forward. Uh, she was also uh, interrogated for intelligence value as well. Um, but again, I think that's a sort of a good example of, of how this situation was resolved in at least one previous case. Uh, and you know, it's hard to sort of answer hypotheticals about it now. Uh, but ultimately, we're, we're cognizant of the need to, uh, that at some point, these kinds of questions will have to be answered. It's not problematic that special forces are on their way whose mission is to capture, and it hasn't yet been determined, what will be done? Well, I think on a case-by-case -case basis, it'll be determined how to resolve the cases of individuals who are detained in these raids. And just one last thing. With Sayef, the Department of Justice had been building a case, potentially a federal ter terrorism case, against Saif, is the intention with this new expeditionary force, the capturing that they'll be doing, that those detainees, would, that the U.S. would be potentially building federal terrorism cases for them to be charged in the U.S.? Uh, I wouldn't rule that out. Uh, in some cases, these are, uh, these uh, expeditionary operations will be carried out against individuals that do, sp do pose a specific threat uh, to the United States or our allies or our interests. Uh, and that could open them up to, um, mm. You know, being part of the criminal justice system here, so I certainly wouldn't uh, rule that out. But again, it's hard to uh, um, uh, to talk about these uh, sort of in the in the abstract here. Uh, you know, each of these cases will be considered on a case by case basis. Okay, Angela. Uh, yesterday, a bipartisan group of senators released a report finding that uh, the drug maker Gilead had charged astronomical prices for a hepatitis C drug. Obviously, the president did stake part of his legacy on expanding health care. Is this particular issue of drug apparent overpricing something that he's likely to weigh on at any point in any way? Well, Angela, the, the president has been quite concerned about the high cost of drug prices. This is one of the, uh, the many overlooked benefits of the Affordable Care Act, that there are millions of Americans that have received billions of dollars in assistance in affording their prescription drugs. Um, and if you take a look at the president's budget, you know, one of the uh, proposals that's been included in the budget for years now has been to give the, uh, uh, is to give HHS greater authority in negotiating uh, drug prices with pharmaceutical companies uh, under Medicare. Uh, so uh, this is something that the president's been focused on for quite some time, and we've made important progress. Billions of dollars in savings for millions of uh, uh, Americans across the country. Uh, but yes, this is an ongoing concern, and this uh, this is not a uh, this is not a problem that has been uh, completely resolved yet. And there's more important work to be done. And um, you know, the president certainly is uh, is interested in trying to uh, address it in a way that's good for middle class families, and certainly is good for uh, keeping health care costs down for businesses. And then secondly, there's early reports out of local news stations in the Los Angeles area that there's been a mass shooting apparently involving at least 20 people shot in uh, San Bernardino. Has the president been briefed on this situation yet? Uh, I'm not aware of those uh, specific reports. It sounds like that's may have been something that's happened since I got out here. But uh, we'll see if we can get you some more information on it. OK. John. Uh, Josh, the British involvement in Syria, isn't that going to be largely more symbolic than anything else? John McCain said this morning, we'll have some token British aircraft. They'll drop a few bombs, and we'll say thank you very much. But to say that it's going to make a significant difference 
No, I've got to be a little more candid than that. Well, I'm disappointed that uh, Senator McCain would speak so cavalierly to diminish the important contribution of one of the United States' closest allies. Uh, the fact is we've asked every member of our 65-nation coalition to ramp up uh, their contributions to this effort. And uh, if the British Parliament were to vote uh, in favor of this decision and the British government were to follow through on this commitment of uh, additional resources to the effort, that's obviously something that we would uh, warmly welcome. Uh, the British military has extraordinary capabilities. Uh, and we certainly would uh, look forward to the opportunity to putting those capabilities to work uh, to advance our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Are you hopeful that the Germans will be similarly forthcoming? Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen a, a renewed commitment from the Germans. Uh, uh, I understand that it also requires some parliamentary approval on their part, but uh, we would welcome a stepped-up contribution from the Germans as well. They also have some uh, important capabilities that could be used uh, to advance our strategy. Okay, thanks. Alexis. Josh, you opened up the briefing by talking about the risk of a shutdown, and it, it just prompted me to think to ask, how is President Obama beginning to do business with Speaker Ryan? Have they spoken on the phone? Are they beginning to do work together? Are they speaking personally? Or how is that beginning to operate? Well, Alexis, I, I don't have uh, a lot of details of their communications to share with you. They have spoken on the phone uh, more than once since uh, Speaker Ryan uh, assumed the job. Uh, as I think we described uh, right around the time that uh, Speaker Ryan got his promotion, uh, we talked about the fact that he is somebody that the President uh, believes is serious about his convictions, uh, even if their approach to addressing these issues uh, in many cases is quite different. Uh, and um, so that's going to require uh, a commitment on the part of both men to find compromise and to seek out common ground and to exploit it when it exists. This, uh, you know, the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, is one example of bipartisan progress. I don't think any Republican is going to say it's a perfect piece of legislation. I don't know that there are any Democrats on Capitol Hill who consider it to be the perfect piece of, of legislation. But it does uh, advance a number of priorities that Democrats and Republicans agree on. I would readily concede that there aren't a whole lot of areas of agreement. Uh, between Democrats and Republicans on some of the most important issues uh, facing the country. But in some ways, I think that makes it all the more important that when there is agreement, that Republicans actually engage in a good faith effort to try to find it and to seize it and advance on it with Democrats. There has been a steady willingness on the part of this president to do so. And uh, you know, we're hopeful that uh, you know, as uh, Speaker Ryan gets his sea legs, uh, that he'll develop uh, the confidence and the capacity uh, to find that common ground. Was it easy to find common ground on the State of the Union state? Uh, it was, actually. It was. So again, it, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're establishing a track record here. So, Leslie. I know you didn't want to talk about personal conversations between the president and the military on the Pentagon, but I was wondering if you could give us some idea of how much the administration was looking to save on a state size relocation. Uh, you mean in terms of the dollar figures? Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't have those figures. I think the case that we have made is that there is money that can be saved. Uh, and when we're talking about taxpayer dollars, we have a responsibility to save uh, as much money as we possibly can. We have a responsibility. Uh, in the government to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And if there's an opportunity for us to spend less of that money and do it in a way that will actually enhance the safety and security of the United States, then it's, it should be a no-brainer. But you don't have a target number that you would hope to well, reach. Well, uh, I guess now it's like 3.4 million a year. I, I don't have a target number to share with you at this point. What I can assure you of, though, is once we have a specific proposal to present to Congress, uh, we'll make it public and we'll be able to take a look uh, at the uh, at the figures and, and, and make a determination about just how much, uh, how many taxpayer dollars can be saved by pursuing the strategy that the President has laid out. It will, it will however, I can assure you, be a strategy that saves money uh, and that makes us safer and is consistent with the view that has been advocated by President George W. Bush, by secretaries of state that have served both Democratic and Republican presidents, uh, and even by some Republican members of Congress. Uh, about the benefits of uh, pursuing the closure of the prison at Guantanamo Bay. Now, the president signing the NDAA, I understand there's a um, congressional reporting mechanism that means that nobody could be transferred from Guantanamo um, until Christmas Eve. 
do you know when how soon transfers could happen after that? Uh, I'm not aware of that specific uh, that provisions. We'll have to follow up with you on that. Okay. Um, the president said he wants to get the population below 100 by the new year. Any? Can you give us any indications of how he plans to do that well, given the NDA restrictions? There are uh, more than 50 uh, individuals who are currently at the prison of Guantanamo Bay that have been cleared for transfer. Uh, and what that means is it means their case has been thoroughly reviewed by national security professionals. Uh, and they have concluded that under the right set of circumstances, these individuals could be housed in other countries. And so what the State Department has done is taken these case files and begun, entered into negotiations with countries around the world to uh, get them to agree to take in these individuals based on the security precautions that we believe are necessary. And um, so that's the way that the process works. And uh, that is certainly what we'll be pursuing to reduce the prison population at, at the prison. And the Wall Street Journal article also suggested that you are considering abandoning the military commissions. Is that something you can talk about? Do you think you get justice faster in the federal courts? Well, uh, again, I, I, um, we have previously said that both uh, Article Three courts and uh, military commissions are, um, are options for, um, you know, for subjecting these individuals to justice. Uh, and I don't have a policy change to announce at this point about whether or not one of those options is taken off the table. Thanks, okay. Josh. Jessica. To follow on the conversation earlier about cyber, um, we actually reported that as well, that the conversation about OPM came up and that China's come forward with evidence. I guess I wonder, in the broader context, uh, this, these dialogues are really about building trust between the two countries. What does it do for U.S. trust if, in fact, China has brought evidence about the OPM hackers? Well, Jessica, I, I don't have a detailed readout uh, of the conversations uh, to share at this point. The fact that the dialogue, however, is taking place uh, is an important step. Being able to communicate clearly uh, with our Chinese counterparts, uh, whether they're national security officials or law enforcement officials, uh, is important. Uh, and can strengthen the relationship between our two countries and can advance uh, goals that both of our countries share and can certainly address the substantial concerns that, uh, that we have raised, uh, including concerns that President Obama raised directly with President Xi just two days ago. So uh, this, is, uh, this is important work, but it's just a, uh, uh, you know, but it's, um, I would acknowledge it represents modest progress that we can be, uh, even begin talking about these issues. But those conversations are important nonetheless and hopefully can serve as a forum for uh, more and continued uh, information sharing between our two countries on this issue that is a top priority to President Obama and to the United States. The Chinese delegation has said, in fact, that there was a consensus and agreement uh, that both parties signed on to yesterday. Is that the case? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have an update on their ongoing talks, but uh, uh, if we can get more on this, we'll, uh, we'll try to do that. Okay. One more, yeah. uh, if I could. Um, <coughs> the Chinese officials have also said that attacks from the U.S. have actually increased after the September visit by the Chinese president, and they've also said that they, there have been no arrests um, made on the U.S. side even after China provided information to them about cyber hacking. I just want to see if you can comment on any of those. Uh, I don't have a comment on that. Okay. Toshi, nice to see you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask about the U.S.-China relation again. And uh, with a joint statement with President Xi on climate change on Monday, the United States and China have been showing, in a sense, joint leadership on climate change. And also, there are many differences in many areas, such as cybersecurity and even tensions in South China Sea. Is, is it fair to say that the United States moving toward in the direction of G2, G with group of, group of two, as it is difficult to solve any global issue without commitments by the two countries? Well, uh, Toshi, the United States continues to see the G20 as the most relevant and effective body for confronting many of the economic uh, challenges um, around the globe. and. Uh, you know, we, we have found that to be a useful uh, mechanism for uh, addressing some of these issues. What's also true, though, Toshi, is that when, on the issue of climate change, when you have the world's two largest emitter, uh, emitters stepping forward uh, one year in advance of climate negotiations to make substantial commitments 
about cutting carbon pollution and fighting climate change, there's no denying that that catalyzed commitments from countries all around the world. It catalyzed the process. And that was a really good thing. Uh, and it, you know, coming into the uh, Paris talks, we've seen commitments from more than 180 countries now uh, to fighting climate change. And uh, that is, uh, that does represent what impact the United States and China can have when we're able to work together in pursuit of a shared goal. Uh, in this case, cutting carbon pollution, fighting climate change, and saving the planet. Uh, and you know, we're hopeful that there will be additional opportunities for the United States and China uh, to work together. As you know, President Obama uh, has said this both in public settings and in private settings uh, with, his, uh, uh, with President Xi, that the United States welcomes a rising China uh, and a rising China that is committed to assuming the international responsibilities that come along with a growing economic power. Uh, and the commitments that China has made in the context of climate change, I think, are a great example uh, of how that influence can be used to advance the interests of China, but also to uh, advance the interests of uh, the global community. Okay. All right, Goyal, I'll give you the last one. This week in Paris, the U.S. and India made history ever since Prime Minister Modi was elected 18 months ago. He met pr uh, President Obama seventh times. And uh, do they uh, now enough clothes that they can pick up the call, uh, pick, pick up the phone and call each other? And how the relations are now between the two leaders and two countries? Mm -hmm. Well, Goyal, uh, the, the President certainly uh, does uh, respect uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, and has appreciation for uh, his uh, skills and abilities as a politician. Uh, he also is somebody who is given the very difficult challenge of sitting atop the world's largest democracy. Now, that's not easy to work, and that's not easy work, and uh, the President of the United States has special insight into how difficult uh, it is. Uh, President Obama has found President Modi to be somebody who is honest and direct somebody who has good command of the facts, uh, somebody who has a clear understanding of uh, the issues that confront uh, his country and our relationship. He also somebody, is somebody that has a clear vision for where he wants to take his country. Uh, and that makes him uh, not just an effective politician, but an effective prime minister. And uh, the president has had the opportunity to uh, consult with uh, Prime Minister Modi on a number of occasions. And I think that isn't just a testament to uh, their good working relationship, it actually is a testament to the important issues that are at stake between our two countries uh, and the ability of the leaders of our two countries to work through those issues and to advance our shared interests uh, is a good thing. It's a good thing for the world. It's also a good thing for the citizens of our two countries. The President had uh, uh, invited Prime Minister Modi for the eighth time early next year at the White House. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, meetings that are on the agenda at this point, but I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, another visit by Prime Minister Modi before the uh, before the end of next year. Second question. Uh, as far as freedom of the press is concerned in Pakistan is at stake because recently the, uh, the civilian government and the military government, they have put the ban on the press not to show any more images of audio, video, or uh, the movement of terrorists, terrorists in, the, in Pakistan, including many of them wanted by the US and <coughs> India. So what do you think, President, think about this? Uh, uh, they will not show any more those terrorists uh, freely speaking against democracy yeah. or against the uh, Goyal, I have to be honest with you, I'm not aware of this uh, specific issue that's been raised, but I'm happy to take a look into it and um, see if you and get back to you if we have a response. Okay? Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.